Welcome to the Women's Well, a place to nourish your health and spirit. I'm Lisa Miller. My guest today, Margaret Verbal, is the author of Maud's Line, a 2016 finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. Her new novel, Cherokee America, was released in February of this year and has been praised in the New York Times as a gift to historical fiction lovers, especially as, quote, an essential corrective to the racially tinged myths created to justify the annihilation of indigenous cultures and the theft of native lands. In March of this year, 2020, Cherokee America won the Spur Award for Best Traditional Western and was shortlisted for the Reading the West Adult Fiction Award. Margaret, an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, lives in Lexington, Kentucky. Welcome, welcome, Margaret. I'm so glad you're here. Well, thank you, Lisa. It's nice to be here. How did your ancestors, in their way, living so close to the land, consider the future for indigenous people and their way of life? Well, they didn't at the time I was growing up. Uh, when I was growing up, the only people in my family who were considered Indians were people who had been enrolled on the Dawes Rolls, uh, which closed about 1907. So if you were born between before 1907 in our family, you were on the rolls and you were an Indian. If you're born in 1908 or like Maud was a little bit after that, even if you were a full blood, you weren't an Indian because the policy, the U.S. policy was that they were gonna give these Indians these allotments, they were gonna enroll them, give them allotments, and then not enroll anybody else, so that after that generation of Indians died out, everybody would be white. So this is a particular problem for Maud, although I never cl clearly articulate that for the reader because it's, it gets you off into things. It's hard to structure a book or talk about anything in a book where all the people in the book know it, and then you have to explain it. Wow, wow, that, right. That makes for very, very awkward writing. So if they all know it, and it's a given, any explanation of it becomes very awkward. So, but anyway, back, back to the point uh, of your question. So when I was growing up, my, mother's generation, most of them, now some of them had been born before 1907, but most of them were born after 1907, so they did not consider themselves Indians. And it was only in the late 1970s that the roles were opened up again and we could enroll and become Cherokees. I would love to talk about more about your family. They're, they're so fascinating to me. In Literary Hub last year, you wrote about your grandmother. You said that she was 60 before she got running water and electricity, that her childhood had been in allotment times when treaties were broken and indigenous people were routinely cheated and murdered. And then as an adult, she lived through the Dust Bowl and her husband losing her land to the bank. So Margaret, when you consider the coping me mechanisms and the tenacity and the perseverance and grit of your grandmother and, and those of her generation and so many Cherokee matriarchs of that time, how did they handle those types of loss to, losses and devastations? And what would you say today about it? Well, they didn't talk about it very much. Um, they really quiet on it, and I think, and of course they were trying to re raise all of us to be completely white people, because they did not think there would be a Cherokee Nation, or very few of them thought there would be a tribe by the time I was a grown person. So, uh, you know, they had been beaten, really, uh, and did not want to, uh, I think they did not want to engender bitterness in any of us and in my generation all of us were light-skinned enough except for one of my first cousins one of my first cousins looked like full blood um, but the rest of us are relatively light-skinned and and some of my third cousins are 
or, or dark. Uh, but for most of us, you know, we could we could just go on and and I think we were, we were, you know, they they wanted to make us functional. They wanted us to have running water and electricity and go to college. Um, and do those kinds of things. And, and they wanted for themselves just to stay out of the way of white people. Your grandmother raised you to talk on her behalf to white people, as you've said before. Yeah, she did. I didn't realize what she, I didn't realize when I was younger what she was doing. Uh, and, you know, if anybody said anything about it, you know, they said, well, she, she's just shy. She's shy. Uh, but of course, as I got older, I realized that, you know, she wasn't really shy around Indians. She was just shy around white people. And it was, was it a strategic plan on her part too? Well, you know, I, I you know, I, she's a pretty strategic person. Yes. Uh, I can tell you that. I wonder, and, I wonder if the, the feeling among that generation was for the children to stay alive, to assimilate into oh, yeah. white oh, culture. Yeah. If, I would just have to wonder if she had some strategy there having you speak for her. Well, I think, I think probably her, her greatest strategy was just self-interest. Uh, she didn't want to be around white people she didn't know. Didn't want to have anything to do with them. And she didn't feel like that she could deal with them, I feel sure. So, you know, she just sent me out to do it. And she sent, you know, my cousins out to do it. I'm an only child, so I don't have brothers and sisters, she could say. And, you know, we, we just, we just thought that was normal. Yeah. You've said that one of the greatest gifts of writing is being able to bring the dead back to life, to oh, give yeah. new substance to their existence. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to us about giving substance to their existence? Well, you know, I think that, um, you know, and I, it may be that everybody feels this way. I don't know if everybody feels this way, but one of the things that Cherokees feel is that, is that um, a closeness to their ancestors. Uh, so you don't ever want to lose your ancestors. And one of the wonderful things about writing these books is that, um, my my ancestors are in them. My grandmother is is a model for for uh, Maud's uh, uh, aunt Nan. Uh, my grandfather is a model for Maud's uh, uncle Rod, and for uh, Maud's father Mustard. And um, so you know, I can just, it's, it's just like I have their personalities with me and I can draw on those personalities. And uh, so it's just, you know, it's like they're here. Um, and and I, that's a, you know, that's a really, that's a wonderful thing about writing this particular kind of history on this uh, novel on, 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 uh, on this particular subject. Uh, and I don't think I'd ever want to write a contemporary novel. I just, um, I, li I like writing historical fiction. I like writing about these people, the ones that I knew directly, and, and the ones also that I didn't know directly, that I knew by hearsay, but that I can imagine. Is it a calling in a way to keep them alive, to keep the Cherokee culture alive. It is a calling in that I recognize, and I recognize this very early on, I recognize this when I was a teenager, that if I didn't do something or, or if somebody didn't do something, that these people were going to be obliterated from history. See, we believed at the time that the tribe would not exist in the future. So, you know, that way, I, I was aware of that. And, and felt like, you know, these are wonderful people. They're some of the brightest people I ever knew. They're totally uneducated, but they're just whip smart. And they had such hard lives. And they, had, you know, they were still living under a great deal of injustice. And I felt like that if somebody didn't tell their story, 
they wouldn't be able to tell that story themselves because they didn't have any education. Mm -hmm. But I had an education, so I could tell it. What would your grandmother say today about you as an author of historical fiction and an award winner at that? Well, um, you know, I, I, well, Grandma would be pleased. Uh, you know, I don't know that she ever read a novel in her life, um, but uh, she'd be tickled, you know, and then she'd go tell me to go to the eggs. I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I I know I have a feeling it's the Cherokee way to not brag about oneself. It's the indigenous way. Yeah. But, oh yeah. But, that's really that right. is absolutely but to, frowned on. But to be proud of the offspring is a very different matter, as in many wisdom traditions. Yeah. Probably. Probably. What does that feel like to just sit with that for a moment? and to just be with their pride in you? Well, um, you know, I don't know. I, ha I haven't thought about that that, that much. Uh, I think they would be pleased. I have been, um, I know that the ones, my family that are alive, that are older than I am, a generation, there are people in my family that are still alive that are a generation older than I am, if you can believe that. Wow, terrific. And they're tickled. They're happy. And uh, because uh, they believe that I have been fair and honest and, and have shown uh, our love, our mutual loved ones in, in a good light. Um, you know, even, even in their faults. <laughs> Margaret, the protagonists of both your award-winning novels, both Maud and Czech, were women of great spirit and personality. Now that they've been captured on the page in all their human dimensionality, and you've had some time to step back from the character development and the writing, now that you have some distance, do you see yourself in those women and do you see each of them in you? They are separate people. Maud is herself. Check is herself. Um, and they are not, they are not me. Now I am sure, and, and people who know me well can look at those characters and say, yeah, that's exactly what <laughs> I wondered. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, don't, I don't particularly see that. I see them as individual people. So would you say that when you're writing, characters are not you, but that they come through you? Well, they definitely come through me. And they, uh, and this is, um, it's almost like being taken over. Um, it's, it's like um, being kidnapped. Uh, you know, you get up in, your mor in the morning, you're yourself, you eat breakfast, and you sit down to write, and then somebody comes in and kidnaps you. And it sees characters. Now, it, if you're lucky, that's what happens. I think there are an awful lot of writers that that never really happens for. Right. But for me, the reason that I, for instance, could write Maud's line in 14 months which is you know really an astonishing rate so you'd spend all this time writing your first novel then your second novel pops oh, up it's only yeah, a, yeah, a little probably, over a year uh, that's a much more simple novel you know so and it doesn't take near the historical research i mean i virtually knew from childhood the predicament these people were in so i didn't even have to research that it was you know i grew up knowing that but Nevertheless, uh, Maud uh, came to me and uh, the story early on, there was a, there was a period, I wrote 
I don't know, seven, 8,000 words in the story. I can't remember exactly which. And then thought, what the heck am I going to do with this character? <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I bumbled around about a week uh, solving that problem. But once I got that problem solved, then, I mean, Maud was with me just, you know, completely every, every single day. Uh, and was easy was easy to write because she was like in my head. Was she with you in the moments you were just going about the mundane activities of your day, even when oh. not sitting in your writing chair, just with you through the day? Oh yeah, so because so much writing takes place when you're not at your computer. I mean, you know, you're at Kroger's and the character says something to you and it's so distracting because you forget, you know, what am I supposed to be buying here? <laughs> uh, and that happens all the time. Yeah, I'm right. I'm writing on the book right now. I'm not very far into it. I'm not ready to say anything about it, except the fact that the character, the main character of it, is just like beating me up, telling me stuff. Does that? You know, literally did that uh, in Kroger today. No kidding. With, so, so that's a really, really good thing because I think a lot of writers are, you know, listen to people talk about their writing and they're, they're like sitting at the computer and they don't know what to write next and they don't know, you know, what they should write their story about. Well, I never had that trouble. It's just like, bam, in my head and I've got to get it out of my fingers or I'm not getting a piece. No kidding. So when you're in Kroger, you're in the grocery store shopping, going about your business, and you hear the character. Do you speak into your into the notes function on your phone? Do you write it down somewhere? Do you carry a little notebook? What's your your habit for remembering? I occasionally do that. Uh, most often, what I do is I keep a little notebook uh, notebook beside my bed. So if the characters say something to me in the middle of the night and they wake me up, I can write that down. Uh, and then go back to sleep and not have to think about it because, you know, they'll keep you from going to sleep and they'll keep you, you know, they keep me awake, just <laughs> chattering around my head. And, How do you and turn it off? How do you turn it off? Well, I write it down. Okay. Uh, and that's why I turn it. That's why that's, I turn it Okay. Off. So it gets satisfied, uh, that, that urge gets satisfied, yeah. that chatter gets satisfied once it's come through your fingers. Yeah, then I know I'm not going to lose it. I can get it in the morning and go back to sleep. So you like to type at your computer? You don't write longhand? Oh, no, I don't write longhand at all. I don't have the patience for longhand because then it has to be trans translated into, into a document later. So I love, I know that you love talking about craft. I love talking about craft. My ears are growing. How do you open the floodgates? for a new project? Do you just have an inkling that you're gonna write something new or does the something new come to you first and say it wants to be written? For me, and I don't, I don't know if this is true for anybody else, but for me, you know, there's certain things that you think about during, during the course of your life that sort of uh, bother you. And those are really good things to write about. And so usually you know where your scabs are. So if you can go to where the scab is and start picking at it, <laughs> that's a really that's a really good thing to do. Now for me, because I write historical fiction, once I know, well, maybe I'll pick at this scab rather than this other scab, what I do is I start background reading. And I might read uh, for several months and take notes before I start trying to write anything. And it, it's much easier, I have found it's much easier to write something if I have a really good background of the time and place that I want to write. A and also have made some decisions ahead of time, decisions about uh, the tone of the book, uh, the point of view, uh, because trying to write that, you know, trying to figure that out while you're writing, is just, you know, 
it's like getting in your car and driving around and then 30 minutes later deciding where you want to go. Well, no, figure out where you want to go before you leave the garage. But things that I have wondered about and been concerned about um, and have been curious about are on the page. Wonder, concern, and curiosity. So that, that's where the scab begins. Yeah, for and, me. Okay, and then you think about tone and point of view and then the floodgates are open. Well, yeah, for me, I have to, I have to, I have to do those things, and I, I would, I would urge other people to do those things just because I think it saves time. Um, but uh, you know, I have come to believe that uh, that the tone that I write in is ultimately gonna have to be a comic tone. That that is the turn of my personality. And anytime that I have tried to write something that does not have that tone, I might write, you know, uh, 80,000 words of it, but I look at it and, and write it again and again because I'm always revising. But ultimately, never be satisfied with it. Mm. And I think that's just a cuts across my grain. Now there may be people, probably are people more talented than I am, that can write in all different kinds of tone. But if, if you look at Cherokee America and you look at Ma's line, um, ultimately there's a comic tone in underneath both those books. It makes sense that you would be putting a part of your heart and soul into the tone. And, um... As a writer, that makes sense to me as well. Yeah, I think it's it's not, it's just that I, I think we, all of us have either a comic outlook or a tragic outlook or a bitter outlook or a whatever outlook. And most everything is sort of funny to me. You and, know, I get that, I get that about you. You know, so it's just hard for me to see the world in any other way. You wrote, um, I, I feel that coming through so much in the beginning of Cherokee America, in like maybe the first um, few chapters. Check is talking to her son, Clifford, and she, yeah. says, she says to him, Clifford, I trust you understand that a man keeps his mouth shut on matters that aren't his direct business. This is one of the things that distinguishes a man from a boy, or from a woman for that matter. Most women don't have sense enough to do that. When you marry, look for a girl who's not a gossip. Clifford hadn't reached puberty, but Czech tried not to miss an opportunity. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I could feel, uh, especially early on in the book, I could feel you, though I didn't know you as the author, um, with such a sense of humor that I knew in addition to the tight sentences, the concise writing, the point, the, the entire point of the story, that I was going to like you, that I was going to like the book because of tone. Oh, good. Well, good. I hope <laughs> I haven't disappointed. <laughs> I want to ask you more about writing flow. So you tend to love it once you're kidnapped by your characters. I have the impression that once you give the go ahead for a new story that you really like being in the flow of the writing what happens for you when you sit down and you allow what's coming through to translate to the page do you lose a sense of time what does it feel like in your body are you just completely in the flow how can you describe what that's like well i um, i write in the mornings so i eat breakfast and i come up here to my study and I write with a cup of coffee over here. And um, so I write for a while. Now, you know, the thing about writing and drinking coffee is that it makes you get up and go to the bathroom. So problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get up and go to the bathroom. And often, if you will get up and just like walk around a little bit, your writing gets better right after you sit back down. There's actually research on that. Um, but uh, so, you know, I do that a couple hours every morning. And then I go off and do something else. And then, you know, these voices are back here in my head. 
And so I, I may come in and take a few notes or write down a few notes, or I may do a little bit of writing in the afternoon if the voices are just insistent. Um, but I try not to completely write it out. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to drain the well completely dry. Hmm. Tell us more about that. What does that mean? Well, when I leave the computer, I want to know where I'm going next in the manuscript. Ah. Mm -hmm. It feels to me like writing, not just writing historical fiction as a calling for you, as, as you've admitted to, but that writing is a calling. You're called. You really are called to write. It's your, is it your, your happy place? Did you know this would be a place that you would spend so much time? Well, I wanted to be a writer when I was younger. I taught uh, English uh, in high school. And I, I wrote, when I was in graduate school, I wrote a few short stories. But you know, writer, it's hard for serious writers, and I think it's hard for, uh, you know, non-literary writers too. It's hard to make a living as a writer. I mean, it's just tough. Yeah. Uh, you know, writers don't get, you know, they're like 10 rich writers in the United States. Everybody else is just poor as church mice. So uh, I needed to make a living. Um, so I made a living. And then when I, when I got about middle-aged, uh, the, uh, I, my fingers started, uh, tingling. And I recognized, and this, I was really working very, very hard at the time. And, um, but I just got to where I could not, not write. So that's what I did. Your fingers started tingling. What was your career at the time? Well, I was a consultant and I consulted, well, I consulted to a lot of uh, folks, but the majority of my work uh, was to, uh, well, at times the majority of my work, and it is now, uh, the, uh, was to consult to organ and tissue and eye procurement agencies uh, and teach people how to ask for livers and hearts and kidneys and um, corneas for transplant. And so I went all over the United States and really, uh, you know, spent uh, nine years working for the NHS in Great Britain doing that. So, you know, I had a pretty intense career doing that while I was, you know, home trying to write about these Indians. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you listened to your tingling fingers. Oh, I didn't have any choice. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even mind editing. You really like you really like the entire process beginning to end. T talk to us about that. Why is even editing joyful for you? Well, the uh, well the least joyful part of writing for me is writing the first draft because I don't know where it's going. And if you read a lot of books, even books by really good authors. You could tell that a lot of authors get about 80% into a book and have no idea how to finish it. I mean, I see that all the time and it terrifies me. So, so you can start out, you can write for months and really have no way to end that book. So the first, uh, and you don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, you know, because most literary writers do not outline. They let what happens happen organically. Um, so that first uh, uh, draft is really sort of terrifying. But after that, it gets a lot of fun. And I, um, I've got a, I've, I've got a third book that's going to come out next fall. And uh, I wrote that book. Uh, I wrote 11 drafts of that book before I sent it to New York. No kidding. And I enjoyed every single one of them because that's where books get better and better is in the revising of them. 
that's where you add in, that's where you take out the crap and add in all the little turns of phrase and all the little details that make it good writing as just opposed to, you know, commercial writing. So um, I love that. Uh, and it's hard to, it, once I do it, it's hard to, it's hard to let a book go. I mean, because it's so, you, you think, well, what am I going to do with my life? You know, to let this book go. <laughs> Is there a point where you have to restrain yourself from editing it one more time? Well, you generally know, or I, I have always known when I have done all I can do on it. And then the first time I get to that feeling, I send it out to readers. And I get their feedback. And then I go at it again a couple of times. And then eventually I think, well, this is, is better. This is all I can do. You know, I oh, can't do it. Yeah. You know, if, I, if I tinker with it any more, more I'm going to screw it up. So you wait for that sense of completion and you just know. Yeah, you just know. I also like editing because it feels to me like that process, well, in that process, I'm playing with the diamond, with the unpolished diamond. The diamond already exists. Now all I have to do is polish it, make it pretty, yeah. have fun with it. Yeah. All the hard work is done. But I have to admit that I'm very impatient. And so by the fifth round of editing, I really just feel like, all right, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to finish this and get it out in the world. I start to get impatient around. Hmm. It's a little, um, a little hitch I got in my giddy up. Maybe, the, maybe you're the, the kind of person that needs to write two books at the same time. <laughs> you know what? You might be right. How do you feel uh, about writers today, young writers who, who are struggling, talking about impatience, what, what do you tell impatient young people who really want a fast pass into the world of publishing? I guess I would tell them they're unlikely to get that. Just really takes time and seasoning. How do you guide them? I think that the, in my experience, most people, this is true of myself, too. Most people, when they sit down to write their first novel, they really want to write about themselves or about their family or something well, like that. Why is that? Well, I, you know, I don't know. I guess because we're more interested in ourselves than we are anything else. I don't know. But almost everybody, that's what they want to do. So I would advise people to do that. Go and do that. Get that out of your system. And then put it in a drawer somewhere. And then find something to write. In general, and outside of writing, what inspires and delights you? Well, I like to travel, which of course I cannot do right now because we're in the middle of this pandemic. But, um, and I like, you know, I like to be with friends. How are you managing? You know, I think I'm managing okay. You know, as well as anybody else is. I'm not, um, I mean, really a pandemic is easier for a writer than it is for anybody else. True. My other business, which is consulting business, I've got on hold now because I have to I have to fly on airplanes and meet with people in person to do that. So I can't do that, which is, you know, I'm not happy about that. I'd like to be doing it. I was doing a lot of it in January and February. Um, but, you know, I get up and read uh, all sorts of source material, sit down and write, exercise, uh, do the things everybody else is doing, sit out, you know, have people on the patio. I mean, that's all we can do. It's not as hard a life as my grandmother lived. I think about that every day. This, this, this is hard for me. It's hard for so many people. And our ancestors had it so much tougher. Oh, yeah. You know, I have seen, I was born before my grandmother got, and grandparents got electricity. 
So I know what it's like to, uh, you know, be out in the country and you have no electricity, you have no running water. Uh, you go to bed when it gets dark, you, you know, uh, if it's wintertime, you don't, you know, you got to go out and cut the wood. Um, you got to cut wood in order to, to uh, heat the stove to have any breakfast or dinner. Uh, so I can probably stand just about anything. I feel the same way. Yeah. Are you, you're, for you, travel is important and being with friends is important. Are you, you, are you seeing friends virtually often? Well, that? I did for a while when we were at the beginning of the pandemic. I did that a lot, but now I have a large patio and um, I have people over on it and I go to other people's large patios. I don't go, in, you know, right now, you know, I haven't been inside anybody's house and I don't know how long. I would love in closing for you to carry us off by reading a favorite passage from your recent novel, Cherokee America. Okay, well, I just want to say for your audience that you just warned me right before we went, when we went on that I was going to do this. Yes, okay? I, so, I, yes yeah. I did. <laughs> you did. We, we'll just be happy. We'll have, be happy to ha have you read a cookbook, but we prefer something from your latest novel. Yeah, well, this is from the middle of Cherokee America. And it is, to give you a, a taste of it, it or the context, uh, check the main character who has, uh, it's her husband's funeral. And he's had a difficult death and they're laying him to rest. And um, this is really from uh, his point of view, he's dead. Uh, but it's sort of his point of view looking down on his own funeral party. And it's just a paragraph. Check was past thought or feeling. But if Andrew's spirit was hovering, he would have found his funeral party, party confounding and wonder how he, a white Yankee merchant turned farmer, had died in such a strange and foreign land. For after the ground was packed, the son of the most famous Cherokee preacher prayed over his grave, first in the native language and then in English. Ceremonial smoke floated from small fires set by family groups. On a spot southeast of the bare earth, a few men and women danced to a chant. Others in the party included white frontier entrepreneurs, former slaves, and more than one man who'd escaped from the law in the United States. But mostly, the mourners were a large group of mixed-blooded people who shared a common history. They were neither Indian nor white, but both, and uniquely American. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm, I'm proud to be a, a Lexington, Kentucky citizen along with you. Well, here, thank you for having me. Here in our beautiful, rich arts community. And to know you now personally, Margaret. It's nice. It's Thank nice. you. And I hope we get to see each other in person. We'll make a date after <laughs> pandemic. Right. And for now, readers can find you at your website, margaretverbal.com. Yep. And all your good interviews are there. You've been interviewed by NPR. And that is available on your website. I know that everyone listening will appreciate both of your books and your third upcoming next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Stay safe, okay? Thank you, Margaret. All right. Bye-bye.